I regularly take this uh, freeway ramp. There are the bridge supports that were built as part of the freeway. And then there are these just ugly things that are just tacked on. And what's worse is if you get looking closely at them, you can see daylight between the these tacked on supports and the bridge structure. Those ugly things are not even doing anything. Now this is YouTube, so I could just go on Wikipedia and make something up. But that's no fun. Let's talk to somebody who actually has a real answer. My name's Jerry DeSantos, uh, J-E-R-R-Y. He's the supervising bridge engineer for four different counties, including this one. He and his fellow nerds uh, work up in there someplace. We are constantly evolving what we do, the design standards, how we construct things to make them safe. Engineers learn lessons from mistakes, like up in Santa Clarita where the Newhall Pass interchange fell down in the 1971 Silmar earthquake, and then it fell down again in the 1994 Northridge earthquake. It has actually collapsed and pancaked atop the northbound lanes. We have a certain design criteria, and every time there's a big event, we have engineers that will go and assess the situation, and then we go back and we research and, and re change our design practice. The lesson learned from that earthquake is how Mother Nature plays these long bridge spans like a guitar. When a seismic event starts making the earth shake back and forth, it's plucking each one of these vertical bridge columns like it's a string. A long column is like a long string and has a deep note, and these short columns are like plucking short strings and have high notes. Because you have basically the lollipop effect, where, where the higher the bridge is, the, the larger the frequency. And then the span of the bridge in between the strings, or the columns, starts tearing apart. It's like a two-year-old smashing discordant notes on the piano. So since the Northridge earthquake, Jerry tells me they have totally changed the way they built these new long bridge spans, like this one here in Corona. They make all of those vertical columns exactly the same length. That way, when Mother Nature plucks the strings, the bridge moves together at the same note. Now you may be thinking, how is that even possible? Bridges have short columns and long columns depending on the ground underneath or how high the bridge has to go. They found a little trick. When a column is shorter than that average standard length, they dig a pipe into the ground. That column goes into the pipe, potentially dozens of feet into the ground, and connects with the dirt down at the bottom of the pipe. So the vertical columns look like they're different sizes, but they're not. Safety is our priority. We've identified um, gaps where we need to retrofit. This guy didn't have automatic emergency braking. Now, if he had the latest crash avoidance technology, his beetle here wouldn't be in the junkyard. He'd still be driving. A new bridge with new bridge technology is less likely to crash to the ground than an old bridge with old technology. So when you're stuck having to keep the old bridge, well, you better buckle up. We're not gonna redesign a bridge if it doesn't need it. We have a retrofit program, which is an economical way to make it safe. But there's a lot of behind the scenes work that's going on. So I guess these things are kind of like a seatbelt. They couldn't justify bulldozing old Bessie here, so they patched it up to make it safe. That is a catcher bent. If there was an event large enough, and an earthquake is, is a horizontal force that caused the, the bridge to you know displace enough where it would fall, that would catch it. That was a, a solution that was you know, designed for that structure. And there's many different kinds of solutions, right? It's there to prevent this structure from falling down onto public, right? Whether you're on the bridge or underneath the bridge, we don't want that happening. And so we'll put elements that will basically help the structure to not fall off. Okay, how about this? This is a bridge pillar at the Interstate 15 and Interstate 10 interchange in Ontario. It's slender on the top, but as it comes part way down, it gets sort of a beer belly from there down. All of the pillars look like this. It's funny, um, I, I'm really proud of my wife. When we travel out of state and she'll see different bridge columns, she'll like, oh, that's a, that's a very slender column. You know, it's not a, a Caltrans earthquake column. Now, if you think about the part of the bridge that holds it up, that vertical column, it's made out of two pieces, metal and concrete. Metal is really strong when you pull on it. A metal bar could tow a house. But it's totally useless when you push on it. 
Concrete, I don't have concrete, so like I say, we'll use Play-Doh, is the opposite. It's pretty strong in compression. It's pretty useless in tension. It just, it just rips apart. So a long time ago, some bridge designers thought this through. They're like, hmm, one is strong when it's being stretched, and one is strong when it's being smushed. I got it. We'll put the metal in the concrete. Boom. This column is now incredibly strong because the concrete can handle the squishy force and the metal can handle the stretchy force. So they would have the problem in an earthquake that as this column was shifting back and forth, chunks of concrete would just start breaking off and the metal would become exposed. And once the metal's exposed, there's nothing to contain it anymore. So it just and it bends out and as it bends out, the bridge gets shorter and bleh, it just falls to the ground. Before we spaced our hoops at one foot apart, okay, and I'm getting a little too much into the weeds here, but there wasn't much horizontal confinement of that concrete. So if it did crack, it would just crack and fall out, right? So yeah, so we're creating this kind of jacket that's gonna keep the concrete, even if it cracks, to be strong enough to support the bridge from falling down. We'd love it to be perfect, right? Uh, fit like a glove, but uh, because of construction, you know, columns, we try to make them perfect, but they're not. So we can get it on there, we can weld it, and then the inside is filled with grout. We try to disguise them, uh, we, we'll paint them gray to try to camouflage them so they look like concrete, but they're typically steel. In California, our bread and butter is the concrete cast in place structure. It's economical for us, right? We, we have the material, water, sand, rock, cementitious material, to build these structures at a very economical price. And so that's why we do that. Uh, steel is great, but, but kind of on the expensive side. A steel girder bridge. So it's gonna look different because you're actually gonna see the steel members. In these steel bridges, you have a beam spanning across the highway from the uh, vertical bent in the middle and then the abutment supports on the side. And as long as everything sits on top of each other, it's fine until the earthquake comes. <laughs> Whoop, that one slips off. And nobody wants people in the northbound lanes done. We have these steel girders that are sitting on top of a bent cap. We're attaching cables together to the steel girders so that if there's enough horizontal force, they would basically keep each other from falling off the bent cap to make sure that these stay together. Cable to this deck. Here. And now these two beams are tied together. So as they slide sideways, if one of them slips off, the cable helps hold this one from totally falling onto the ground. There may be displacement. We may have to do some repair work, but the bridge is not going to fall down because we put those cable restrainers. That's the goal. That's the dirty little secret about seismic engineering that you're probably picking up on. Old bridges crash like old cars. Everybody's gonna survive, that's awesome. But when it's all said and done, the bridge is about as useful as this old beetle here. Um, sometimes on a very long bridge connector, you'll see almost like a step, okay? We're trying to create a point of no moment, okay? So, which is, which is a bending force, okay? Moment is more of a complicated engineering term, and to be honest between you and me, I was sort of a B student. The second time I took a class, I was a B student. So we put these hinge in there to, to, to prevent the moment transfer. Okay, so if I understand Jerry correctly, these long bridge stands um, can wobble. You know, you have a column here and a column here, and it can flex back and forth in an unpredictable manner. So they put a hinge in the middle, and now it wobbles in a predictable place that they can plan for. And planning for things is what engineering is all about. What we've learned is some bridges have a very short seat, some are sitting on a very long seat. Now, it doesn't necessarily look like a fold in a paper. It looks kind of like a stair step, where one set of bridges sits on top of the other. We've learned that there's going to be displacement. In an earthquake, if that stair step is kind of small, it could slide apart, and one part could fall off the other. So at the hinges, we'll put hinge restrainers. It's a cable that's inside, so if there's enough displacement, that cable will prevent that hinge from unseating. 
That's on the shorter seats that we have out there, newer, newer hinges, we have longer seats. Thermal, I mean, temperature does affect these structures where they'll just, you know, expand and contract. And so we get a lot of uh, inquiries. They, oh, the, the, the bridge, you know, there's a big gap in the bridge. There, there are hinge restrainers inside that allow it to move, but yet not fall off the seat. If you live in a state that doesn't have earthquakes, bridge seismic failure is probably not going to be the way you die. But along the ring of fire, engineers have to keep a close eye on it. After the 1989 and 1994 earthquakes, engineers for Caltrans identified 2,200 seismically deficient bridges. But they needed money to fix it. In the 1996 election, voters approved Prop 192, which spent $2.5 billion to retrofit bridges across California. And as of the most recent data I can find, it appears that all 2,200 bridges have been fixed. So in the Golden State, I feel pretty safe driving on state-owned highways. Washington State has a similar program in progress. Although its financing has come in in little incremental pieces, the engineers are chipping away at the backlog of problems. It's Oregon that has me a bit concerned. The state found 1,600 bridges that had problems, which would require about a billion and a half dollars to fix it. The Oregon Department of Transportation has struggled to get financing from the legislature. Limited funding allowed ODOT to accomplish only part of the initial goal of seismically retrofitting state bridges. As of 2009, 178 bridges received a phase one seismic retrofit. So it's worth noting that there's a political side to seismic engineering, further complicating a very complicated topic. Of course, speaking of complicated seismic solutions, sometimes the simple ones are the best. There's really no magic to this thing. It's a block of concrete. The abutment seats will have catcher blocks at the abutment, just tucked underneath. So if that top part of the bridge slides off of its support this way, it falls on the concrete so it doesn't crush the traffic below. The thing is just a block of concrete that's there. The girder were to displace, it would land on that catcher block. A big thank you to Jerry DeSantos and everybody over at District 8 for helping me out with this story. Imagine being the researcher who first presented this at an academic conference. I tease, but if I were driving under this bridge when the earthquake hits, this block of concrete's gonna be my friend. I actually created a Facebook and a Twitter. So feel free to ask me a question on there and hopefully I can answer it, at least on Facebook or Twitter, but maybe it'll turn into a video, who knows?